I'm Bart Moss Sinclair, and this is The Amateur Academic, a YouTube channel where we take apart topics, turn them into lectures, and turn you into an amateur academic. This time around, we're going to talk about nanotechnology, predicting the future. Now, wait a second. What is nanotechnology? Can we even predict the future? That's what we're going to find out. First, to talk about this subject, we're going to discuss what exactly is a nanometer? How small is it? Because it is really teeny tiny. It's unimaginable. And we're going to take a tour of the nano world. Number two, we're going to talk about predicting the future. How do you do that? Well, let's have a closer look at that. How do we predict the future? There are three ways that I know of to predict the future. Number one, you look at the past to try to extrapolate what will take place in the future. Number two, you look at the present for trends to try to figure out what will come next. And number three, you look at establishing physical limits, upper and lower bounds of what is possible and what is not. Let's get right into looking at the present. We can tie that to our point one, how small is the nanometer? Let's do that right now. Let's get out our Prezi and take a look at the world of nano. So how small is a nanometer? Well, let's start with something we know, something we can wrap our heads around. A human hair. Not just any hair, mind you. One of mine. I donated it for the good of science. Also, we have here our magic microscope to peer into the world of the macro, micro, and even nano. Let's take a closer look. Oh, there we go. That's our first unit of reference. The width of a human hair is 100 micrometer. That's 10 to the negative fourth meters. This letter right here is a Greek alphabet letter, mu, from micro. But we're still not seeing anything in the nano area yet. Although we know how much 100 microns are, or micrometers. Let's zoom in for an even closer look. Oh, there we go. We're starting to see something here in this area. Hmm. Let's get even closer now. Aha! Here we go. We found us a bacteria. Not just any bacteria, a very special bacteria. A good friend of mine, E. coli. E. coli exists in your intestines and actually evolved from your intestines. However, this is not the good type of E. coli that helps you. This is the bad kind that gives you food poisoning. It is the O157H7. This is courtesy of the CDC. I'd like to give them a shout out for having such wonderful research and images available online. This particular E. coli is around two micrometers in length. Now, why is this interesting on our journey into the nano realm? Well, bacteria, especially E. coli, are used in biolabs all over the world. They stink up those labs, but they also produce something very helpful, proteins. We're going to be hearing more about those later on. E. coli, for example, was the first bacteria to host foreign DNA. It's used in production of insulin. You have to think of bacteria as tiny little factories of protein. And so that's why they rule the biotech world. Let's take an even deeper, closer look at something even smaller. Right here, aha! We found something in the nanometer area. This right here? It's 120 nanometers across. It's an HIV virus. A virus really is a nanorobot, a biological nanorobot, <clears throat> in the sense that they can actually be programmed, and they need, of course, cells. They need cells for reproduction. They are not self-replicating nanorobots. To do that, what they do is they have this protein envelope called a capsid, they use that to attach themselves to certain types of cells, whether in animals or plants, of course this one being in humans. Once they attach themselves to the correct cell, they can then penetrate into the cell through the 
the cell wall and input their programming, that is their DNA or RNA, into the cell, hijacking it, taking it over to produce more virus. So they encode their DNA, RNA into the protein synthesis of the cell. Then they assemble that in the cell and it's released. Now, why is this helpful for us? They seem, viruses seem very harmful, but in actuality, we can program them ourselves. There are many companies doing this, such as Juno, doing gene therapy, for example, to cure diseases like cancer. There is going to be a lot of nanotechnologies available in the next five to 10 years that take advantage of viruses, reprogramming them to attack our cells and actually help our cells, such as the T cells, for fighting cancers. So this is definitely a biotech to look out for. Let's drill it down even smaller and go into the 20 nanometer range. Wow, we've got a lot going on right here, don't we? First off, of course, you'll notice this double helix. This is for a comparison. The length of this here is about 2.5 nanometers. So we're in the really small area now. And what do we have here? This is a microprocessor or part of one. It's a FinFET type microprocessor instead of a MOSFET. Not to be confused with Boba Fett, which is something else entirely in Star Wars. This right here is a multi-layered processor, a FinFET. You hear the term fin because you have fins sticking out, whereby a MOSFET is only two-dimensional. That's all you really need to know about these, besides the node length. The node length is very crucial for measuring microprocessors. The node length is how many things you can fit on to a microprocessor before you have to repeat the pattern. And the node length of this particular processor from IBM is 10 nanometers. This is going to be coming out very soon on the market. The 10 nanometer is the next step. Right now, currently, we're at 14 nanometer node length. Now, why is this important? Well, maybe you've heard of something called Moore's Law, whereby the density of processors, thereby the frequency and the speed, doubles every two years. Our economy is based off of this. To make sure these processors can get ever faster and smaller, Moore's Law predicts always what will happen next. And all of the huge conglomerates of chip manufacturers adhere to this law. It is somewhat enforced artificially. Getting into the 10 nanometer node, however, presents problems. The reason they're using FinFETs instead of MOSFETs, which are, of course, as I said, three-dimensional, is because you start getting signal problems. When things get really tiny, you get into quantum effects, and not the helpful kind like in quantum computers, but in the kind that cause problems. In this case, you get an effect called quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is where, for example, in this case, an electron could hop right through the walls of this transistor, whereby it would create signal noise, degrading the processor. There is one way to fix this, and that would be by upping the voltage, but that's not a really good idea. Instead, they decided to take materials such as zirconium oxide that have a higher kappa constant, that is, dielectric constant, to insulate these very thin, few atom thick walls better. And that's a good hack to be able to continue using silicon in our processors. However, there is a limit to what you can do and how much you can hack silicon before you cannot make processors any denser. That will be around 7 to 5 nanometer node length. So what do you do then when you're all out of space at the bottom? Well, you can call on this guy right here. What is this? You can kind of make this out. This here is a multi-walled carbon nanotube. We can replace these silicon oxide transistors with carbon 
which we can make ever smaller, preserving Moore's Law and our economy in the near future. And that's what we're going to discuss next in our next video, so stay tuned for that one. It's a very, very, very small world, but there's plenty of room at the bottom.